Hi, welcome to Be Green with Amy. I'm Amy and today we have a special episode with Dr. Kushik Reddy, who is a cardiologist here in Southwest Florida at the VA. He has a wonderful, very refreshing presentation for you and I really hope you enjoy it. Very popular and have a personal compelling story. Uh, I, I don't, I, I actually don't have a personal transformation. You know, weight loss was never an issue for me, disease modified, at a personal level. None of those were a, a, an issue for me. Uh, and, you know, graduated cardiology and went down to practice at the VA. And, you know, I was into seven, eight years into my practice. On a day, what I call a routine day, and uh, I did about five or six uh, angiograms and angioplasties, sat down at my desk to write reports. And while I was doing the reports, and I, I had no idea why I did not ask the question prior, I have no idea why I asked the question that day, but I did. Is uh, that kind of made an observation while I'm compiling reports, patient after patient, as I finalized the report, every single one of them needed a scan. Uh, some of them as an elective uh, angioplasty because they are having angina, and some as an emergency angioplasty because they came into our emergency room because of an ongoing heart attack. Uh, either side, either way you look at it, in a stable situation or unstable situation, Every single one of them had those perfect combination of risk factors. High blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, sleep apnea, a certain degree of overweight. And, uh, and, and if you really look at the numbers and the, the combination of medical therapy and the, the frequency of medical follow-ups, they were not neglected by the medical system. They were being treated. Now, if you're a diabetic, guess what? We have a diabetes education program. We have a, a panel of doctors who are being, you know, their, their, their quality of care is being measured by, you know, certain targets being met, your hemoglobin A1C. So the system is taking care of these, these patients. And the question that I asked that day was that if we are actually treating you with all of our, our MDs, PhDs, and you know, registered dietitian degrees and diplomas wrapped around us in white coats, why are you in my cardiac cath? Why are you having a heart attack if we are treating you? And I did not have an answer to that question. And that was deeply troubling, very deeply troubling. And I actually felt an awkward moment feeling that I actually got my entire years of practice and training completely wrong. Hmm. Uh, and I truly felt the need to reinvent myself. And I shared this joke with everybody. And then back then, my wife used to work at the, the Newport Ritchie VA clinic. So we had a tie line. So I just dialed the extension. It goes directly to her desk. And she was ready. And she was available to take a call. And she, and I told her, look, I'm, I'm really having a bad day today. I just don't, you know, I'm looking at this work. And it's beautiful work. And if you look at my angiograms, you know, difficult cases. But I, I got the procedure done. But I don't think I'm liking what I do. And she laughs at me and she goes, we call this midlife crisis. <laughs> uh, and so we kind of joked about this and I said, you know, well, I really need to do something differently here. And so I, looked, I started looking, he said, you know, what are the best ways to prevent? And just Google searching and, and everywhere I looked, anything that looked and felt authentic from a scientific point of view was leading to nutrition, nutrition, and nutrition. And, and that was even more embarrassing because I had no like, complete void of knowledge. I, I didn't know how to speak nutrition. I didn't know what it meant, except using the catchphrase that I built is, eat healthy, go see a dietitian. Mm -hmm. that, that was my advice to my patients. Mm -hmm. you know, and, but for me to get into the nitty gritty details mm -hmm. of the science of you know, nutrition evolution, the science of how to take this from a book to a bedside and compassionately, passionately convince a human being to change their food, it is difficult, it's very difficult. You can master the science, but enabling someone to see the value in what you're trying to tell them as a doctor. Because, you know, uh, like I was talking to one of you earlier, is that if I stand here and talk, give a lecture on cardiology, I'm the only expert, right? Because not everybody's a cardiologist. But guess what? Everybody eats. So in our own personal right, everybody is an expert. Uh, so that's where the emotions and, uh, and, and, and you know, the, the frustrations, they, they run pretty deep and, you know, everybody has a strong opinion. So within the confines of that opinion, without stepping on anybody's toes, how do you enable them to see the change and bring about the change and see the value in what you're telling them? That, that, that to me was a humbling experience. And then uh, around the same time, another personal story that, that actually happened around the same time was 
we went to Sarasota Beach uh, for my birthday weekend, kind of a quick unplanned getaway. And we were, um, so in the evening we took the kids, everybody to do, I'm a landscape photographer by hobby, that's one of my things that I'm like equally passionate as, as, as passionate I'm about nutrition is the photography as a hobby. So I'm taking these pictures of the kids at the sunset and about 100 yards to the left of us, there was a little bit of commotion and a lot of people were gathering. So we ran to see what, what, what's going on. So these young kids, fishermen, they pulled out a shark about this big. Uh, so the, the photographer and me, I basically got to the ground level and I'm taking this long blanket red exposures of this old, you know, uh, fisherman and the shark. And the next thing I hear is my daughter uh, kind of arguing with them. And her point was that, you know, we, we, you can't kind of can't do this. You know, this is if this is, and then they were kind of an emotional conversation, 11 year old kid. And then as we walked away from the scene and she grasped my hand and said, daddy, this is what it takes for me to eat fish. I don't want to be part of this. And I'm saying to myself, you know, she's 11 years old, she's probably going to last a week because her favorite food is daddy's uh, salmon, grilled salmon. And I said, but you know, I just want to be supportive because if something came so naturally to her and I'm not going to talk her in and out of it, I'm just going to let it be and be supportive for her and see where it goes. And I'll be honest with you, as an 11 year old kid, she was the only plant-based eater in the house of five, including two physicians in the house. <laughs> and she did her thing for two years by herself. And those two years went by, we, we really, you know, we, yeah, she's doing her thing, <coughs> but I never really looked deeper into it. And around the same time, this, my personal experience with my patient list happened around the same time. And then I'm in a quest now because I wanted to do something, but I, the way I drive my life and my personal life and my professional life is through science. Is that because to me, it has helped me in all aspects of my life is to, is to be, so that way, because you know, when I open my mouth and say something to a, to a person, even in, you know, outside the context of my profession, I'm still a doctor. So that carries some weight. You know, even when people come to my house for dinner, when they've been asking for an opinion, they're not asking for an opinion on a book to read. <laughs> that could have their, you know, their impacts on, on their life. So to me, it's the doctor part of me never leaves me. It's always, it's, it's for most of us doctors, it's always with you. So to me, it, it's humbling till this day that how do I read something, right, and master a book and ace a board exam question and be on the top of the list, and that's the easy part. The real part is how do you read something so complex and take it to a fellow human being and potentially mess it up and lose their life. And that freaks me out and that actually scares me till this day. You know, although I have 20 plus years behind me in experience. So same thing with nutrition. And first, and first of all, I have no formal training in nutrition. And that is even harder. So I was looking for resources and avenues. You know, how do I how do I get comfortable with this? So, and it was just going on, we're trying to kind of cut down our meat intake, cut down our dairy intake, but we are losing the battle. And then on the same time, on a Saturday, we woke up, turned the TV on, Angela, we turned the TV on. Uh, we didn't just start, you know, we're just getting, the, you know, the, 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 uh, getting ready for the day. And I'm hearing this very interesting voice uh, coming through TV uh, saying that heart disease can be reversed. That's the sentence. I said, what the heck did this guy just say? Heart disease can be reversed. And I, yeah, and I, and I, and I don't know this. So I mean, perfect timing because I'm, I'm on, on a quest to figure that same stuff out. So I walked up and it is PBS Joel Furman. And I literally found myself completely glued to the bed watching, the, watching his entire program. And I said, wow, here is a guy. And I started calling him my mentor by proxy. Uh, that's what I, I call them. So I, I read literally all of his books and pretty much mastered his Eat to Live book. And without actually permission from him, I plagiarized the second chapter, I think, in his book is as a, as a title for my talks. Let's not dig our graves from our graves with knives and forks. I think it's chapter two on Eat to Live. You know, let's not dig our graves with forks and knives. So I started teaching because the power was so, you know, uh, uh, to me, so overwhelming that I, I literally had to share it. And, and, and what I say is that, you know, for those of us who landed into any type of, you know, remember that from high school to college into any professional training uh, in medicine, and I remember that day when I got into medicine, it's such an excitement, oh my God, this is it, this is what I, I work my, all my you know, youth for to get into this medical school. And then you go to, you know, you attend one lecture, and then you sit down at the library because you're eager to learn so much. And then I, I, I used to remember this, I used to go to the library for biochemistry, I used to have six books piled up on print 
and then I realized, you know what, it is an entire, it's going to take an entire lifetime. But that 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 youthful eagerness to, you know, uh, pun intended here, but grab more than you can chew kind of thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I found that 35 years after I started medical school all over again, because when I opened Foreman's book, I said, this is all, this is just completely new. And I was like, literally just, and then what I did differently than most, most non-medical readers is that I would pull every reference. I actually, because I have full access to all these journals through my university access. So I would literally pull actual manuscripts and I actually I would verify. And then I would actually send emails to, to Dr. Greger. I would send emails to Dr. Furman. You know what, in this book, in this chapter, on this paragraph, your citation of this, this reference, I'm disagreeing with it. Uh, are because of these XYZ reasons. Because that's the only way I'm going to understand this is to discourse a scientific, polite discourse of agreement and disagreement, and, and then we and, and that's how I got into it. And then I started teaching, I started talking to patients, started talking to friends, started talking to family members, um, and then in my life, uh, and I said when I started changing completely my diet into a nutritarian or a plant-based uh, whole food plant-based eater, I did not force anybody in the family to do it my way or, or highway kind of thing. Because this is such a deep thing, you know, like then we asked a couple of days ago when uh, we spoke at the, the Buddhist temple, I joked about it. Somebody stopped me five years ago and said, there's going to be a day in the future where you're not going to eat your mom's chicken curry. And I would have said, just get, get out of my house. What, what are you talking about? This is just not going to happen. But now we've done, and now we did. Yeah, but, but I do all these things even now. I'm actually, I'll share another thing. Uh, I, what a few weeks ago, I told a patient of mine who has irregular heartbeat, and I said, you got to quit smoking, you got to quit caffeine. You know, a certain degree of caffeine, you know, depending on how you read the data, there are some benefits to it. Not, but not if, you're, if your heart is racing and you're taking pills for it. But and I was driving home, then it dawned on me, you know what, I just told this man to give up caffeine. What, what, what does it mean? You know, emotionally, what does a person go through? So today is my day number five without caffeine. So this happened last week. So when I do this, I, I do a lot of these experiments on myself. So I kind of have that sense of feeling about when I say these words, to try this, give up this, or try different food, what would a fellow human being go through? Do, do I really know it, or am I just doing a lip service mm -hmm. and washing my hands? Uh, because this is, not, this is not gonna work with lip service. Because you know, lip service is writing a, writing a pill and ordering a procedure, which I'm very good at. Uh, but to really connect with a deeper level to bring about a change in human behavior, it's very difficult. And to be able to do that, to, to empathy is a big word, but to, to kind of understand where I'm connecting with them. I, I conduct a lot of these experiments on myself. Uh, is, to, is, to, is to honestly look in the eye and say those things. And uh, so once I got there, you know, and the children, they took their own time to see the value in this. And uh, what really did it for the entire family to take it to a different level was that I had signed up for uh, the preview or, or the early release of uh, What the Hell. Mm -hmm. So March of last year, uh, I was at the Orlando airport going to India to attend to stay with my dad for a week as he was getting ready for his knee replacement. So a couple of hours before I boarded the international flight, I got a little ping on my phone saying that whole health, you know, What the Hell is now, now available for viewing. And you, you already paid for it, you have access. So I downloaded the, the code onto my iPad and I said, oh, I'm gonna watch it on the on flight. And I sent my, the link to my, my, my wife, hey, look, I'm gonna watch this movie. Why don't you guys watch it while I'm in India? So next thing I know, by the time I come home, the whole family said, we're all 100% planning this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I share this as an example because, that it, because each one of us is gonna have a different reason as to why, why we are changing. And then as a physician, and now you know, having learned you know, a little bit about nutrition, I'm gonna enable you to, once you, once you see the value in it, I'm the guy who's gonna give it a little bit of a scientific face uh, and see how we can sustain this. Uh, and doing which, you can stay away from a guy like me. Uh, you can stay away from my, the need for my procedures. And, and that human interaction has taken me, taught me, it's unbelievable how much it has taught me. The stuff that I never thought, the simple question I ask my friend, the first question I ask them is that, what do you want your health for? And just the answers that I get from those questions, like why do you want to be healthy and what do you want to do with that health? And the emotion, because some people tell me, nobody ever asked me that question. What, what do you mean, you actually care for my health? 
That's, that's what one of, the, one of the veterans told me, is that you, you actually care for my health. I said, yes, I do. <laughs> so what, but what would you do with it? Uh, one of the best examples I would like to share with you was a 91-year-old veteran who was sent to Tampa from Hernando County VA Clinic. And the reason he was sent to me was that he's having shortness of breath. So I sit across the desk in my office on a Monday morning with a 91-year-old U.S. veteran, and I ask him a question, look, you pretty much declared yourself, you're 91 years old, you're probably from toward the end of World War II, if World War II didn't kill you, mm -hmm. 91 years of life didn't kill you, do you want a cardiologist to do it? <laughs> what, what do you want me to do? You're 91 years old and you look pretty good. He goes, I asked him, look, what, what, do you, what do you want? And you're short of breath. At 91, if you're short of breath, how bad is it, doc? Here is the deal. The same question I asked him, if I, if I do a magic on you and I allow you to walk out of this door, completely healthy, nothing changes, you're still 91 years old, but you're 100% healthy, what would you want to do with that health? Mm -hmm. He looked at me and said something, all that I want to do is go back to ballroom dance. Mm -hmm. I said, why aren't you? I said, Doc, here is the problem. My daughter left because of a job situation. She good girl, she really was my, you know, uh, best pal, uh, but got me situated in a nice home. Pro that's not a problem. Finances is not a problem. I have a nice setup. Uh, but she was my, you know, my emotional being. I depended on her for a lot of things. But now she's no longer with me. She went out of state for a job, and I got depressed. And food became my best friend. And I gained 45 pounds in one year. Imagine what it can do to you in 45 days. 45 pounds in one year at age 90. Of course, she's going to be short of breath. And I said, so what I need to meet him where he is in. If I ask him to meet him at my 100% utilitarian way of complete plant-based eating with 20 ingredients and all, it's not going to work. So I said, tell me what you eat. So this man depends on frozen food, thawing, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's what he's used to see. Keep it very simple. I said, let's work along the same lines. All that I want you to do is that for 10 days, and you'll be the judge to see which one. For 10 days, can you eat steel cut oatmeal with fresh berries for breakfast? Just for 10 days. Very easy, I can easily do that, no big deal. Because I eat the same breakfast any day, every day. So it's just a different kind, but it's still the same breakfast every day. And then go to Winn-Dixie, buy a whole bunch of canned beans. And the only other thing that I'm gonna ask you is that keep buying salads every couple of days. Right, for dinner, you eat whatever you're still eating, I'm not gonna change. But for lunch, every day, after oatmeal, for breakfast, Fresh beans with some fresh vegetables, saute them a little bit, and put them in your salad and eat. Oh, you know, if that's doable. Three months later, he calls me and says he lost 51 pounds. 51? Yeah. Three or four months later. He's a 91 year old man. And he's back to ballroom dancing. And another story is a captain of a, of a submarine from Vietnam. So I met him because one of my partners asked me to cover for him. But, so otherwise, I would have never met him that day. So my partner had to go somewhere on a Friday. So it was his duty, actually, it was his rotation to see patients in the hospital. Instead, he asked me to cover for him. And I said, fine, I'll cover for you. So I'm randomly walking with my house staff and you know, cardiology trainees. And I met this man and said, Dr. Reddy, there's no options for this man. So we, there's really no treatment options. Okay, fine, no, I don't know you as a patient. Let me look at the chart. Yeah, medically, you're on everything. Uh, that's why they're telling me there's no treatment options. Yet, you are ending up in the hospital with heart failure after heart failure, right? Has anyone ever talked to you about going on a complete plant-based nutrition? Not plant-based junk nutrition, but plant-based whole food, plant-based type of nutrition. He immediately sits up, takes a notepad, okay, talk to me. Those were his words, exactly. But nobody ever given me an option that I can get better with food, but I don't know what to do. So this man literally took notes, very sophisticated guy, he's a captain of a submarine, okay? So, very sophisticated guy, he took all the notes, but he's also the guy that his living situation was that if the, somebody from the hospital system at the VA, if we didn't kind of a care for him, he was literally at the mercy of the system because he had no family, it was just his entire was, you know, whatever you say, doc, I will, I will follow your instructions. So when I hear those, when I see that type of social situations, I actually give my personal cell phone number to the veterans. So, day number 10, I'm driving my family to for a light show in St. Augustine. So we were in a traffic jam on 75 going up. 
So he calls me. You know what he said to me? You are not, this, I, 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 you know, it's a little, you know, this one, you are not shitting me when you told me that my hand wanna come off of insulin, are you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't, what's going on? He said, no, today is day number nine. I, I'm used to waking up with the sugars of close to 160, 170, and I take my insulin, I eat my breakfast, but last two days, I woke up with the numbers below 70. So today is my first day in the last 14 years that I'm not taking insulin this morning. Oh. And he was actually crying on the phone. So when I hear these stories like this, guess what? I go back and read more. Mm. Uh, to see how is this, you know, what is unique about this man that I can, I can use this. Uh, and, uh, and there's another story, you know, I was just sharing with, the, with the Mike earlier, is that there is a man that I met about 14, 15 months ago uh, in the setting of a heart attack. And I came to the hospital and I was on the cat lab rotation, so I did a heart catheterization. And, and he's a diabetic, uh, overweight, and with a typical, you know, the constellation of all the risk factors. And the pumping capacity of the heart, what we call injection fraction, was at 15%. So in the combination of diabetes, low pumping capacity of the heart, and severe multi-vessel blockages, the standard of treatment is that you go for a bypass operation. That's what I told him, that's what all the surgeons told him, that was our consensus opinion. And he said, no, I'm not going, because he was, because of his religious beliefs that he didn't want any blood transfusion as a part of his, uh, his cardiac surgery. He was a Jehovah's Witness. I said, okay, that's fine. But our surgeon, although while capable, uh, we don't have the infrastructure to do a completely bloodless surgery at the VA hospital, we'll send you to Tampa General. He goes to Tampa General and he gets an opinion that he needs cardiac transplantation. And that freaks him and family out and they actually sign out that he can take his medical advice. They go home, they call me, and then I refer them to a doctor in Naples that I said, he's the guy that I trust and he knows how to do this you know, cardiac surgery without any need for blood transfusion. But while we wait for all of this to plug in, why don't we work on some, making some changes? Because you're, you're convincing yourself to go have your chest cut open. Right, before we get there, why not try a few other things? And said, so fine, and I actually made the connection. They actually spoke with Dr. Esselstyn himself three times, the family. Esselstyn is one of those people who still talks to people on a daily basis on his cell phone. And th that was my motivation, you know what? If Dr. Esselstyn at his age and at his, his level in his career is still giving out his personal cell phone numbers to patients mm -hmm. from all over the country, wow. I should be able to accommodate the same. <laughs> not that big of a deal. So, and we kind of went back and forth and he never really did the perfect, perfect plant-based diet. But he came almost close to, you know, 80, 90% compliance. And six, seven months into it, the combination of, you know, contemporary medical therapy and the diet, no surgery, he never went for surgery. His heart became, pumping capacity became completely normal. Hmm. Completely normal. And then he saw me about four weeks ago in follow-up. He and I kept on touch with phone and through our secure messaging network in the VM. So four weeks ago, he comes to see me and during that meeting, he really upset me. He said, Doc, 14 months have passed and I miss my meat. I miss my years, you know, like my, I said, wow, 14 months later, you still miss it while I'm telling you that your heart completely normalized, you're angina free, you're off of insulin. I said, what are you doing? Because to be compliant and also to be healthy about my way of eating, I took up ketogenic diet. I said, okay, tell me exactly what you're eating. What, what are you eating as a part of the ketogenic diet? And he told me that he's starting his day with that bulletproof coffee, mm -hmm. the, butter and the, the, coffee. the butter and the coffee. Mm -hmm. And then he admitted to me that he's eating a lot more meat because he missed it so much than he did before, 14 months before, before the initial heart attack. And I, and I warned him, I said, look, you know, you, you, you already have extensive established heart disease. And in this degree of exposure to, to, to animal products and, and processed, processed you know, dairy products and high quantities of saturated fat, it's gonna put you at a risk for probably an acute event. And it was terrible that he actually showed up in the hospital this past Thursday with a heart attack. Mm -hmm. the, and the pumping capacity went down to 35% again. Yeah. 
So I, I, I hate, I, you know, I hate to say to any fellow human being, I told you so in a situation like that. So we, we had another conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, we had another long conversation as to, you know, so now he's going to go back. Uh, but again, you know, I, I clearly I'm tell people that this is not a fan. I'm not selling you products. I'm not selling you some, you know, DVD discs or my membership or my, my recipe is better than others. All that we have is that we have all the levels of evidence. You know, I mean, you know, another thing, you know, it's someone like this, this gentleman that I just talked about, is that there's really no other data that's been shown to reverse heart disease. It's never, except for whole food plant-based diet. You know, we have Dr. Arnish's data and we have Dr. Esselstyn's data. Uh, and we, you know, hopefully we should be able to do much larger studies now that, that you know, we have so much more information about it. Uh, so that's my plea to all my patients is that, and anybody who asks me is that I'm not selling anything to you. I just want you to use what Mother Nature, Evolution, God, whatever power that you believe in, intended for us to eat. And then one of the frequent arguments that I get is that, you know, from an evolutionary past, you know, we were hunter-gatherers and we were meat-eaters, so there's a biological need to eat meat. I said, not in 21st century. There's really no need, there's no biological need. Yeah, it might have served some, some evolutionary purpose from, you know, pre-humans to humans or early human years. But if you really, even if you put in a 21st century, you know, uh, you know, foraging or hunter-gatherer type of population, there's a beautiful paper published last year, is that a team that studies a lot of coronary CT angiograms to, to quantify plaque burden in human, human coronary systems. So they took a bunch of CT scanners on trucks to went into these deep jungles of Bolivia, right? To see what one, what are these people eating? Right? And what is there in their coronaries? Because now, unlike doing autopsies, we can actually look at the minor nitty gritty details of coronary calcium and the plaque burden. So what they found was that a lot of these people are walking around looking for food, right? And hunting and you know, small bush animals. Yeah. But they spend about eight hours a day. They spend eight hours a day covering an average area of 18 kilometers, okay? Only to come home and end up the day with eating 72% of carbohydrates that were pulled out from Mother Earth as tubers by their women. <laughs> so, their, their daily, so their daily fat consumption is 14% and their daily protein consumption from an animal kill is about 14%. But to be able to do that, they are walking 18 kilometers and spending eight hours looking for food while they are also potentially running the risk of being killed by another wild animal. So if we do that in America, that you run for 18 hours, for eight hours a day, and you want to have a piece of steak at the end of the day, go, go, go for the kill. Otherwise, 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 stand in line behind me for the style ball. <laughs> And that's what I tell them, you know, but when you bring this paleolithic and, you know, keto arguments, do we do anything like a paleolithic human being did? We don't. We live in a completely different world. Yeah. And that's one of the things that, you know, the opponents of this argument frequently bring this up. They said, oh, human evolution. I said, why, why are we going back 70,000 years, 100,000 years? Do we do anything like people did like 70,000 years ago? Mm -hmm. So, and the best way to put it is, like Dr. McDougall's way, is that people use these as excuses to, because they like hearing good news about their bad habits. <laughs> and, and human evolution is a nice way to kind of, a, you know, punt an argument or, or, or put forth an argument. But we don't do anything like that anymore. You know, the nutrient density is different, I agree with that, but look at the disease burden. Yeah, and then this is another nice segue into you know why nutrition? Why you know why why should we focus on nutrition as the center pillar for human health? Is if you look at the global burden of disease studies, it's a landmark you know database. Year after year after year, they continuously show, including the third world, the number one cause of death, disability, morbidity, and mortality is dietary risk. That's the number one risk. And if you look at from number two, if you put number two aside, which is smoking, and go on down the list, the next four are the direct consequence of a dietary risk, which is high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, and obesity. In the, in the middle at number two is smoking. 
which is, again is a lifestyle. So is it possible that when you look at these trends across the planet, that humans in 21st centuries are dying as a direct consequence as the most intelligent species that ever walked on the planet? The reason we are dying is we are choosing to do something with our own hands and put in our mouth. So we are still dying of foodborne illness. It may not be, you know, salmonella in this century. We're still dying of foodborne illness. And now if you look at it from a cardiovascular point of view, every year American Heart Association publishes their the preceding year's statistics in the society. You know, where is the smoking rates in America? How is diabetes controlled? How is blood pressure controlled? How is cholesterol controlled? And then they sample size about four or 5,000 people. They actually interview that many people to see exactly what, you know, say only 10% of people are smoking because you got to do a survey to say that statement. So it turns out that only nine to 15% of us are smokers. But to say that 85%, 80 to 85% of us don't smoke anymore, but it took us almost 130 years of relentless campaign, right? This is another thing that comes up very frequently from the opposing viewpoint. Oh, your data is all just you know cross-sectional. Your data is just observational. Uh, there is no randomized trial to prove that this is the reason why people are dying. Uh, and I said, oh wow, do you smoke? No, no, it's bad for you. Where did that, that data come from? Did we ever have a randomized controlled trial for smoking cessation? No, we never did. So why, why did we stop smoking? Because we believed in observational studies. Because it's unethical to randomize people, take young men and say, hey, 100 of you smoke, 100 of you don't smoke, and we're gonna follow you for 20 years. <laughs> because we know every signal pointed towards smoking is bad for you. Right? So you can't, so we never held smoking to, to a ran, double blind randomized control trial. Why are we asking nutrition to double blind? Because it's difficult. You can't double blind to nutrition. People are not going to know what you're eating. But there's a lot more common sense to it. Again, why do we need science to tell this? Which species is eating based on randomized control trial? Does it do, does, does giraffe eat based on, you know, hey, what trial do I need to eat? <laughs> Right? The lot of it is common sense and what is natural and what is evolutionary. And we move so far away from it. We move so far away from it. And smoking is less than 10%. Diabetes is 80% well controlled. Cholesterol is almost close to 80% well controlled. So is hypertension. So here is my argument. If less than 10% of us are smokers, 80 to 85% of our diabetes, hypertension, and high cholesterol are extremely well controlled. So now between those four, almost all the most important major risk factor for heart disease are under control. Yet, yet, more people die in America due to heart disease than all American wars combined. We lose 600,000 people. Why is that? The reason behind that is that if you look at the same bar graph, there's a, in the middle, there's a bar graph for healthy diet index. Red means bad, yellow means okay, green means you're excellent. There is not even a single pixel of green in that bar graph. I wish I was able to have that. In this one graph I show people, this is 2017 American Heart Association data, that the signal for healthy diet score then one said, oh wow, you guys have made, you guys have must have made the, the, the healthy diet definition unattainable. That's why nobody's meeting you guys. Uh -huh. Take a minute and read it. Dr. Furman would actually spit on it. <laughs> it's not a perfect definition by any means because they give, you know, practicality, they call it. They give a lot of room for, you know, flexibility in terms of flexitarian type of diet. It's not a strict vegetarian diet. But even a, 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 a poorly defined healthy diet score is attained by only 0.3% of adults in America. So if that does not give the medical community and the society at large a moment of pause, I don't know what else would do. Despite all this campaign, 
uh, uh, 0.3, only 0.3% detectable. And, and the data is out there, you know, Dr. Arnie showed his to us. And, you know, Dr. Esselstyn took, literally took angiograms of people with acute coronary syndromes, cardiologists entering Cleveland Clinic with a heart attack. Uh, went on to have their angiograms repeated, only to find out that the blood pressure looks like a teenager's. <laughs> and the other thing is long-term data, is that, you know, again, a lot of this is cross-sectional, long-term observational data, because that's what we have except for some very, very few, very small randomized trials, is that everything is pointing towards increase more fruits and vegetables. And another way to convince a lot of people is that, you know, although I disagree with some of the policies of USDA, uh, or the writings of USDA, but they are very consistent in one thing. They approve only three patterns of eating for Americans, only three patterns. One is the Mediterranean pattern, which is predominantly plant-based. The second one is the healthy American diet. And they actually looked at a pattern of you know, each, each region of America, northern patterns, southern patterns, California pattern, eastern seaboard pattern. Of all the things that your chance of survival at five years was the highest with a completely vegetarian diet. So they support a healthy American way of eating, which is again, mostly plant-based. And the third one is a pure vegetarian diet. So these are the only three dietary patterns where the foundation of every one of them is whole food plant-based and the variations thereof, minor variations. Even for high blood pressure, right? A lot of people, a lot of doctors, I did not know this, is that the famous DASH diet, right? DASH diet works, it actually made it to the guidelines, it's beautiful. But if you really get into the nitty gritty type of this, the chair, the chair who conceived, the chairman of the DASH committee, that made the study happen and published the study or so everything, few years before DASH committee was put together, published another paper showing that the best response to high blood pressure is with a pure vegetarian diet. One of the founding ideals of DASH, DASH committee in conceiving the DASH diet with the National Institute of Health funding was to create a pattern of diet that would give us Results that are identical to that of a vegetarian diet. Mm -hmm. Yet they included some dairy, low-fat dairy, fish, and poultry because, the, you know, in their own in infinite wisdom, they felt that a pure, pure vegetarian diet may not be attainable by everybody. But we make it mostly plant-based and give some room for, you know, chicken, fish, and some low-fat dairy. At least more people will be compliant with this. Yet, it hasn't really worked, because despite all this campaign, if we were to master high blood pressure, why is the kidney disease going up, mm. right? Anything that this kidney disease is going up, that's another big concern within the medical community that the kidney disease is going up, because we are dumping too much protein into our body. We, are, we have become this protein, protein, proteinaholic type of a country, asking where is my protein? And that's one of the reasons I did this when we spoke at the, at the, the Buddhist temple, is that I usually, I started doing this, I actually got a kick out of this, I ask people, because that's a frequent question that gets asked, where do you get your protein from? So I, I asked the audience, I said, you know, like for example, let's say the mean, the mean age in this room, let's say is 50, and there, let's say there are 50 of us. That's 2,500 human years of experience. How many of you with the 2,500 human years of experience have seen if a friend or a loved one get hospitalized or die due to protein deficiency, or dietary fat deficiency, zero. The next question, how many of you know someone who suffered miserable life due to high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, heart disease, cancer, guess what, every hand goes up. So I said, now that we settle this issue, please don't interrupt me in the middle of my presentation and they're asking me the question where do I get my protein from? Because we just answered it. Right? So there's really no biological need to go seek out protein, protein, because proteins are the building blocks of everything. It's almost impossible to be protein deficient if you eat a well-balanced whole food plant-based diet. Yeah, you don't even have to count your protein unless, you know, once you get to 65, maybe you have to be a little bit more because just to make sure that you don't lose muscle mass. Uh, maybe load up on beans a little bit more than that you're eating it, but, that, but that's about it. Uh, the VA started a program called Whole Health, 
and it is by far the best lifestyle program ever put together by anybody that I've ever seen. It's a national program and then we are very fortunate in the Tampa VA to have gotten the designation as a, as a flagship site. And there are 18 sites that are up fully operational with the flagship designation. And it's, it's, if you look at it, if you just go, go to Google and look at the VA whole health circle, it's every component of human health. It's like, almost like a circle of life. You know, mindfulness, Tai Chi, yoga, food, drinks, uh, you know, how to kind of self-care, meditation. Uh, we actually teach meditation classes now at the VA. So I'm, I know, so I'm one of the education champions for the Tampa VA to, to promote the lifestyle. So two half a days a week, I actually stopped working for cardiology. So two half a days a week, I, I just work for whole, the Department of Whole Health, uh, teaching you know employees, fellow physicians, and patients. And uh, we started a re uh, recently. We started a healthy teaching kitchen under cardiology and under whole health combination with the dietitians, two dietitians, and 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 a, and a psychologist. So we actually invite. We meet in a room like a room. We meet in a room like this with actually a portable kitchen. I, I do a half an hour presentation and one of the dietitians who's also a chef actually cooks a meal. Uh, the last time when we did this, we intentionally did not add salt or oil to a soup, a lentil soup, and nobody could tell the difference. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those veterans were, you know, were suffering from high blood pressure. And I said, if something can taste so good without any salt, why won't you try this before me adding another blood pressure pill to you? Mm -hmm. and, so, and it's changing. And then we actually do an employee health lecture series now. We just started this last month. Uh, once a month, we, we, we hold a lecture to our employees at the VA, teaching about uh, exclusively. It took me a took me a little bit of a of a, of a negotiation with my administration and the other other key players who are involved to actually use the phrase on those handouts. You know, lifestyle is medicine, a whole foods plant based approach to health. But to put that phrase on on the handout, it took a little bit of negotiation, but we got it done. And same thing for our patients. Uh, you know, we, we, we were able to create a handout titled uh, Heart to Heart, a conversation with the cardiologist. And with the subtitle, a plant-based nutrition approach to healthy heart. Uh, and then I'm in the process of now, uh, hopefully by the end of this uh, couple, next couple of months, a, a cardiology-based uh, group clinic that anybody who has had a heart attack or a stent, I'll be meeting with them on a weekly basis uh, to show them how using nothing but food uh, how they can do things that they don't end up in my lab again. So it, it really works. This is this is uh, that's what I go on tell everybody. Look, okay, this is not a gimmick. This is not a, a sales pitch. But so that's where we are. And uh, my goal is to to give it give it as much power and as much presence as possible locally. Uh, you might some of you may know that there's a college now, the national level called American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Uh, so I'm a member of that and uh, I'm going to be the national chair for the VA and the Department of Defense. So we are able to form a, a group of people from the VA healthcare system and the Department of Defense and all of us come together because if you put the VA and the Department of Defense, the lock, this is the largest integrated healthcare system in the country. There's no, there's no other system that's bigger than these two. And if we can make this the primary message, as life, but to be able to do that, you need to find like-minded individuals and a network of committee that's going to oversee all of this. To be able to do that, so we formed a working group under American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So we are meeting the first meeting. Uh, we already had one teleconference meeting. Uh, everybody's super excited. Uh, it's almost like not a doctor's when when you hear this, when you hear this message, uh, because of a huge burnout amongst physician community. Uh, people are seeing this as wow. This is why we went into medical school in the first place. Up until we got into sucked into this this mundane way of you know pills and procedures, pills and procedures, uh, without any emphasis on lifestyle. So the pendulum is swinging. And otherwise, we just can't sustain. We can't sustain at an individual level. We can't sustain at a, at a societal level, and even bigger, we can't sustain as a planet. So so everything kind of uh, kind of it's going to take a long time though. It is going to take a long time because there are still hospitals, 13 states still support. Uh, legally, uh, the, the existence of uh, fast food uh, restaurants inside a hospital. The floor is one of them. Uh, there are hospitals still allowing the sales of uh, cheeseburgers and, and, and bacon on the same floor where we do balloon angioplasties and bypass operations. Uh, but for all of that to change, it's, 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 I wish I can do this and things change tomorrow, 
Uh, but that's where you know these kind of you know, community events come in. You know, each one drop drop makes an ocean, uh, and then uh, we'll get there. It's a slow process, uh, but I hope it doesn't take as long as it did with smoking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. to, But I, I think I hope I live to see a day when 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 the society would cringe just just the way we cringed at the sight of a, a, a mother handing a, a cigarette to a ten year old. That I would live to see a day we would do the same thing with the mother handing a hot dog to a ten year old. But it took, we remember, you know, it used to be normal. Parents used to hand cigarettes to 10 year olds. And, you know, people, you know, when people call, you know, I, I was called one day, you know, that you, 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 you're just, a, you know, you're, you're almost like a cultish vegan zealot. <laughs> and I said, how nice of you that you say that, pay that compliment to me, because here is my slide. I had to go forward a few slides. I said, look, here is a newspaper clipping from 1961 where few mothers petitioned to a school board that the teachers are smoking in the school and their little elementary school kids should not be exposed to the smoking. Those mothers were called anti-nicotine zealots. <laughs> in the newspaper, I said, look, history is doomed by people who don't read it. And we know the phrase, you know, history repeats itself only by people who don't read it. <laughs> Because there was nothing good about the good old days. People used to die of pneumonia. People thought American Heart Association used to promote saying that moderate smoking is good for you. American Medical Association. So don't say that good, they were, old days were good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so that's kind of my story, where I am, what I'm doing, and I'm just kind of you know, sharing and spreading the message to as many people as I can. Have you been able to offer at your VA clinic for your cardiac patients, the whole food plant-based meals after the procedure? Ah, very good question. So, uh, just like any other hospital, uh, the, you know, my hospital, the food that we offer to a veteran is not, not, not evidence-based, is not necessarily the best food there is. But what I have done, because when the patient gets admitted to my service, Meaning that we do this week at a time. So let's say next week I am I am the doctor whose name is going to be every, every patient is going to get admitted to my service, and for that week that's my duty. My, that's my assigned duty. I'm going to go see all the patients and take care of them and teach. So what I'm instructed every time I go on on, on a service is that if you admit a patient to my name officially at the chart, the diet we, at, the, at the time of admission the diet goes vegan. Believe, believe it or not, the VA hospital has an option. You can order a vegan diet. It's actually not bad. It's not necessarily the best, but it's actually it's a, it's a pretty decent meal. And I do it not to not to you know force my way of eating onto a patient that I never met. I, I to me that's a conversation start because a lot of patients and a lot of families you know some of them they you know politely ask some of them are offended some of them are upset. So this is exactly what I want because I just want to rev up that conversation. So to me, it allows me an opportunity to have that conversation. And then I said, look, you know, you, if you are here with congestive heart failure, you should not be eating bacon and sausage for breakfast. Mm -hmm. Right? We, we, I, I, will, I, will, I will personally make the phone call to the kitchen downstairs and make you a tofu scrambles with some, 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 you know, some peppers and tomatoes. And we can make that happen for you. But I just want, because it's going to prolong the length of hospitalization, increase the risk of re-hospitalization. So, so we're doing that, and it, it's it's a difficult process. But I do that have that option, and uh, you know, my, again, in a utopian view, you know, no hospital should be serving processed meats in a hospital. No hospital should be doing that, because, not because of my personal beliefs. American Medical Association unanimously passed that motion two years ago uh, for processed meats. So it's not a mandate, it's not a it's not a legislature, but the most prestigious and one of the longest lasting scientific body in America, when they met to cast votes, the line had to print out two blocks outside the building. And then and the and the people who put forth the motion, they thought that it was going to be a contentious debate. And to their you know, pleasant surprise, I would say that not a single nay vote. There was a unanimously passed resolution. Yeah, and and with, with processed meats and uh, with the sugary beverages should not be made available in a hospital to patients, employees, and visitors. Mm -hmm. 
So the onus is us on us now, both as as, as for, for you know for non-medical people to demand that when you go to the hospital, and for us to implement it as you know as providers and administrators at the hospital, yeah, because you know, because there is science supporting it. Yeah, when I say that I'm not doing it because I'm trying to convert everybody into some kind of a Buddhist monk or a Hindu Indian, <laughs> that's not what I'm doing here. When I ask people, right? It's not because of my personal, you know, some I got some my personal agenda, and because I can sell some vegan product to the hospital. It's, it's that, that's what I tell people. The only thing I have to talk about and to share is, is the science that I've learned. It's so powerful that I actually feel sometimes ashamed that I, how come I did not know this all these years. And, it, and it, it's crazy. It's, it's concerning, yeah. You, you know, I, I wonder from a doctor's point of view, if I was a doctor, knowing what you know now and standard of care and everything else, when you see a patient and you're making that decision, how does it change now? Okay, you know, maybe he could have stents, bypass, sure, all these things, or you know, like you said, the carrot or the stent. Sure, sure. So, are you conflicted now? To no, actually, it's, it's a very good question that you asked. I used to be conflicted in the early days of doing it because one, I did not know the nutrition science as well as I do now, and while I'm advising to you, always in the back of my mind used to lurk the fear of medical legality to it. Right. That's what I'm looking. right. But now I know enough and I have enough experience where I have the dual honor at my hospital as the guy who does some of the most complex procedures and also the guy who cancels the most number of procedures. Do you get pushback? From no, no, luckily no, no. I actually have huge support. I may, have, I may be in a unique glass palace where every single one of my partner is, 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 is with me. Hmm. They may not practice in their, in their personal life, but I haven't seen anybody oppose it. Yeah, I haven't seen anybody oppose it. Just by hearing me talk to, you know, very, you know, caringly and you know, passionately talk to, to the CCU, uh, intensive care cardiology patients. Uh, I, I've never personally counseled a single nurse in the CCU, uh, but what they told me, uh, I have to verify this, but what they told me is that except for one nurse, just by hearing me speak for the past couple of years, not to them, but them overhearing my conversations with the patients we have in common, Every single day shift nurse is a plant, the whole food plant based leader except one. <laughs> yeah, and a couple of my junior partners completely changed what they bring from home for lunch. One guy actually shows it to me, Kaushik, he says, You're doing a box of salad, you're making me do this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he's happy about it. Yeah. So, so I have made it in such a way that I, I, I'm trying to meet where people are and try not, not to mandate it because you know, all of a sudden I've seen it because everybody has to do my way kind of thing because that's not going to go anywhere. But from a patient-to-patient -patient interaction, I feel very comfortable now. I, I actually, we present every Wednesday, we have a, a, a combined conference where we meet with the cardiology doctors and our cardiac surgeon, and we discuss complex cases. In that meeting, I bring up this issue. I said, look, we know that, I, I did the angiogram, I'm not disagreeing that the patient had blockages, but he's not in the throes of an acute, you know, life or death heart attack. And his heart's pumping capacity hasn't suffered any major insult. He's stable. So this is what we call as chronic stable heart disease. This is exactly what Dr. Ornish and Dr. Esselstyn taught us, that you can reverse this process. And they all agree now. They actually officially, I get official consults to see these patients now. So I, I, I have that, that good support from even from our surgeons. <coughs> yeah. and, uh, and now another thing that had happened was that these, these veterans that I say I treat them for heart disease, they come back, another pattern I've noticed is that they're other things are getting better. Their depression is getting better, right? Their skin crashes are getting better. Their sexual function is getting better, especially with the depression, so much so that the Department of Psychiatry now asked me to do a psychiatry grand rounds in November. I'm a cardiologist. I actually, I already prepared the slides. My first slide is that, what the heck am I doing here? <laughs> I'm a, talking in front of a psychiatrist about depression and diet and cardiovascular disease. And, uh, and I talked, I, I, I had a lecture about lung diseases uh, in front of a pulmonary doctors, and I titled my talk, Let's Take a Deep Breath. <laughs> Meaning, in a sense, that let's take a deep breath and pause and actually take a look at the role of nutrition in lung disease. And, uh, and the same thing with, you know, I gave a lecture in front of a group of you know, endocrinologists, and, and the chief of endocrinologists stood up and said, Guys, let's be honest here. I'm the chief of endocrinology. Everything this man says is right. 
the only reason we don't practice this way of endocrinology is because there is no buck in broccoli. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. Yeah, and that is true because you know there's there is no money in nutrition. When done the right way, you know, who, you know who's going to get benefited? Because if you imagine if every single one of my patients took my advice to the core and they followed, you know, Nutritarian or any Dr. Greger's way, any one of these leading, you know, pioneers' way of eating, close to 75% of stable heart disease will disappear and they will never need my services. So it's kind of a kind of an awkward feeling that I'm actually now that I know you know fairly good amount about confident about nutrition, it's almost like a a sense of guilt knowing that my entire practice, my entire field of science exists based upon X number of people being sick of diseases that they need not be. There are diseases that the medical science has done some miracles with, and there's always going to be need for that. But not these lifestyle diseases. But we built an empire, you know, based upon certain people being sick. And then they'll come back for another episode, and they're on medication. For it's the funny you said that because I use that coming back. I I tell all the time. I said I look at an angiogram, and I'm teaching my students, and I said, look, guys, you know, very complex, nasty, ugly-looking lesion, and I'm going to teach you guys how to make it look beautiful. We're going to call this Botox of the coronaries. <laughs> okay, and I'm going to teach you how to make this look beautiful. This complex, like pulse, like nasty calcium and multiple ways of blockages. And we're going to, we're going to go through the stepwise technique of how to master this dexterity of Botoxing the coronaries. Okay, I said, why do you say that, Dr. Reddy? Because we're going to make it look so beautiful. But guess what? The patient is going to come back asking for more. Hmm. Look at this, just look at our, not my, my personal belief, just look at our data. Mm -hmm. Need for repeat remascularization, you know, just except for the new drug coated stents that have made a huge difference, but still it continues to be there. Another thing that I'm looking at now is an interesting way of you know, looking at it is that these powerful influences, you know, somebody ends up with, in the middle of the night with a massive heart attack, or they need a bypass operation and they have their chest cut open, and they, 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 they survived. Everything went well, no complications, they are ready to go home. So when we go meet them, frequently, very frequently, patients and the family, they shake our hands, we get a lot of hugs, Doc, thank you for saving my life. Thank you for saving my dad's life, my husband's life, my wife's life. This was a wake up call. I am gonna clean up. I am gonna clean up, right? So I'm actually looking at this now, so we will hopefully publish it in, this, in the near future, is, uh, does that influence having potentially died on a cat's label because of a massive heart attack? Or the influence of having your chest cut open by a stranger that you met only two days before, three, two weeks before? <clears throat> How powerful is that for a human being to change their behavior? So we, I'm, I'm looking into it. I'm like, so what we're looking at is that uh, uh, if you're labeled an active smoker on the day of, day of the event, did you quit smoking? On the day of the event, if your BMI was more than 30, where are you six months a year from now? What we, when I looked at the early pattern, it turns out 70% of people don't change, mm -hmm. right? But if that is the observation, am I, as a cardiologist, stand on a high pedestal and look down upon 70% of humanity with disease and say, you're just a bunch of morons who don't care for yourself? Is that the problem? Or is it also remotely possible that the problem is actually with me? Because my approach has always been pills and procedures. I never connected with these people in a compassionate way to change their lifestyle. Right? We never took ownership of that part of being a physician. Yes, I'm married to someone with heart disease. He's had a stent. And I've been a vegetarian for 18 years. I'm a former patient of Dr. Berman, and my husband has seen my health recovery and my transformation. Sure. So he knows, he knows both. But to him, his doctor says, you've had the stent, so you no longer have a blockage. These medic you take these medications, and you'll be fine. And then I say, he sees how I eat, and that is too much work. Yeah. But what his doctor says is, is easy, and his doctor says, take these medications and you'll be fine. 
So the way to answer, so that, that comes up quite a bit. So the way to compare that is that if you look at the best medical therapy, like for someone, someone with known heart disease, never had an event, but they're stable ischemic heart disease. And there is a famous trial that looked at this. If you offer them the best of medical therapy, best of beta blockers, best of statins, best of ACE inhibitors, aspirin, and you get them to quit smoking, and they are the best of medical therapy, and then they go on to eat this, whatever they want to eat, and you follow them. And when we follow them, for at the end of four years, a third of them, 33% of them will overlap and will end up needing a procedure, right? And, and, and all these people were, were looked at. You know, it's not like an es estimation. We know that they have heart disease because we actually performed angiograms on them. Now, do you compare that, 33%, you compare that to what Dr. Esselstyn showed, the exact same thing. He took people with angiogram-proven heart disease, right? And he put them on a completely plant-based diet, right? No, nope. the extremely strict version of it. At the end of exact same length, 3.7 years, the event rate in his trial was 0.6%. Why would you take a chance? <laughs> at least, you know, you don't have to, nobody's perfect. But at least you need to stop, disease is there, just turn around and give this approach a look. And whether you wanna jog, whether you wanna run, we will work with you on that. But if disease is there, and despite us telling you that your three vessel disease, if you wanna still go that way and keep popping pills, it's just not gonna work. Yeah, I, I think what, I, I've heard this, but a lot of people, the same exact thing. It is the permission slip for people. They, they use their doctor as an excuse. Mm -hmm. But if a doctor was to say, look, if you don't change your diet, oh. maybe to your husband, yeah. you're gonna end up right back on the operating table. Here. Right, I know. The teachable moment, yeah. the permanent no, 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 here, I no. mean, I say that to him, but I'm right, not but if the authority your doctor, doctor did. No, the next time when we meet, just let me, I'll definitely bring some slides, because if you see the visual, you know, because you guys are asking some really sophisticated questions, the visual would be, because American College of Cardiology just published a paper like two weeks ago on the prevention and, and you know dietary choices and the risk imposed by high cholesterol. And in, this, in there, there's a beautiful graph that, that we knew, but the amazing way the authors, the way they showed it, is that high cholesterol and its, and its related risk. So some of it is genetic risk, right? So let's say you're born, and then, then you're born with this X amount of inherited risk. The rest of the risk that you're going to accumulate over the course of your lifetime is your acquired risk, right? Because you're going to, whatever your life, lifestyle choices that you, you, that you prefer. And what they showed is that majority of our life accumulated risk happens between ages 2 and 18. Right? And the, and, the, and the proof behind that is that if you take a sample size across the country, our mean LDL, the bad cholesterol, is around 130 at age, you know, if you take 40 year old people. But if you take 40 year old people and check their bad cholesterol, they are 130. At birth, it should be 50 to 60. Normal humans, normal mammalian species should have 50 to 60. But how did we get to 40 by the time, 130 by the time we are 40? Guess what? Most of us get to 125 by the time you are 18. So what happens between 18 and 40 is only a teeny, teeny minuscule bump. So most of your acquired risk is happening between ages two and 18. And the proof in this is that when you do this, unfortunate young children who die of motor vehicle accidents or other causes, and when they go through an autopsy, they have blockages, they have, have plaques, severe atherosclerosis. On top of this now, diabetes is accumulating. You know, children with type two diabetes, on an average, we are diagnosing 10 to 15,000. And that, in my opinion, is just a tip of an iceberg. There are probably a lot more. Children, children with type two diabetes. Yeah. And you know, yeah, yes, you know, an animal product based way of eating is, is a part of the equation, but also part of the equation is this high calorie junk foods. Mm -hmm. You know, cocoa, you know, this, all this, you know, sugary, all you know, sugary beverages, you know, very, very high calorie processed carbohydrates. And, uh, and that's a norm. You know, children are eating a lot of this stuff, and that, that Department of Defense actually now thinks this is a national security risk because when they, when these young kids go to ROTC, uh, most of them are failing, and so they actually published published a huge document last year uh, saying that the the 50 to 60 percent of men are failing the physical to to get enlisted. 
So for them, it's, it's where are you going to tap into for people to, to, to be, you know, to be mission ready? That there was a paper that America may not be mission ready because of health reasons. So we, we have to change, you know, my goal is to, you know, just working through a community like we are doing here, is to change as many, as many minds as we all possibly can and see where it goes. At the end of all of it, all that we can say is, look, we tried. That's all we can say. We just sit, sit down, we did not sit on the sidelines and just let it go. Like Einstein said, world, world, world will not be destroyed by evil people, but, but, but by the people who sit on the sidelines. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Do you see people outside of there and stuff? No, no, no. I'm hundred percent VA doctor. Mm -hmm. I don't, I can't, I yeah, that, that's that's the situation I'm in. Yeah, I wish I could come see you, but I yeah, But what I do on the outside is do this is just be community participation, you know, talks, give lectures, go to other non VA, you know, uh, locations, you know, be, be 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 some kind of a voice working with, you know, I know a lot of these guys now personally, Dr. Foreman and other other big players, uh, to just to kind of, you know, uh, using their mentorship. To just get the word out and because I, I see that now a lot of my generation of uh, specialists and primary care doctors there's a huge voice this is picking up yeah, yeah you know I, I, I tell Joel Foreman and Dr. Esselstyn that I, I truly feel that if I'm able to do something meaningful in this field it's because I'm literally standing on your shoulders mm -hmm. uh, compared to you know these guys when they were screaming about this 20 years ago you know, no, nobody really cared. Nobody really paid attention. You know, Dean Ornish published the paper in the early 90s. Right there, that should have become the mandatory read in every cardiology and medical school curriculum. Mm. Now, you know, a generation later, we're still struggling to just make this mainstream. But I, I think that, that because of the social media and the international connectivity, uh, more, more people are a lot more connected than, than we ever were. So there are certain good things, I guess, they come out of Facebook and social media. <laughs> yeah, it, it does work though. You know, I see a lot of groups and a lot of people chatting about this, a lot of people being extremely passionate. And some people take this whole veganism or plant-based diet to another almost like a cultish level. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that comes up frequently. I tell people, you know, look, if you want to use the word veganism, that's okay, but I choose not to. Uh, because it's, it's, it's not very really reflective of a scientific message that I'm sending. Uh, because that's one of the reasons why if you really look at pure self-proclaimed vegans, their health metrics are actually poor. Yeah, and, and, and opposing camps, you know, all these you guys vegans are depressed, vegan. I said, guys, you know, that we, that's not the terminology, it's the whole thing, you know, the nutritarian way of doing it. And I, I love that term and Dr. Furman uses it because it is so scientific and it's so simple. Uh, it's actually sometimes even better than whole food plant based way of eating because I could eat, you know, because if I load up, what if I load up on nothing but all white potatoes? It is whole foods, it is plant-based. But is it truly, you know, does it fit that health equals N over C equation? It doesn't. So that, that's kind of my message. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks for joining another episode of Be Green with Amy. And until next time, remember, Tell us what you thought about this wonderful presentation in the comments below. And don't forget, click up here to subscribe. And until next time, be strong, be well, and be, be green. Bye-bye.